segment three, the return of the Jedi with his light board. Okay, I'm going to talk about a physical application, mechanical oscillations. So I imagine that I have a stage which is at position y of t, which I'm going to say is y0 cosine of omega t. Okay, so in other words, I've got, I have, a, say, a stage in my hand, and it's at some particular position, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be moving it up and down sinusoidally with a certain frequency omega. y0 here is the sort of the amplitude. And attached to this stage, we will have a mass, here's the mass, it's got mass m, and it's attached by a spring. Here's the spring. Okay, so we are of course heading towards a mechanical problem here, so we're going to be using Newton's law. There is a number of forces that are acting, Gravity is acting down here. The position of the mass here, let's call that big X of T. All right, so X is measured down here. Big X of T is the position. Big Y of T is the position of this stage. This distance, that means, is going to be big X minus big Y. And since this is a spring, there is a force which is going to be directed upwards when you stretch it, and there's a spring constant, K. And the usual theory for elastic springs and so forth tells you that the, the force back upwards would be the spring constant times the length, and the length is X minus Y. So minus k x minus y is going to be the spring force. Gravity times the mass is going to be pulling you down. And in addition, we'll put some damping in there. Let's assume, for example, that there's a little bit of air drag. And there's going to be a coefficient describing that, d. Air drag is something where you have a resistive force that's proportional to the speed. So d times the speed will give you the drag force. Right, so it's going to be minus d times the speed of the mass, x dot. So that's the, that's the drag force. The gravity force is going to be mg. The spring force is going to be k x minus y, and it's going to be pointing up. Right, the drag's pointing away from the motion, gravity force is acting down. So we've got these three forces, and Newton's law would then say that mass times acceleration, the acceleration will be the second derivative of that, equals the forces, so it's mg, minus the damping force, dx dot, minus the spring force, That's Newton's law. Right, so that's the second order ODE that tells us where the mass is. And this is what big Y is, so I, can, I could in principle feed that in at this point. So I've got some known function of time, a whole bunch of known parameters, and I need to solve this for big X. It's a second order problem, so to begin, to complete the solution, what I would need is, is, is to say where the mass is and what its speed is at t is equal to zero. That would be a type of initial value problem. Okay, so that's, that's the physical problem. All right, so it corresponds to me having a spring with a mass on. At the end of my hand, I'm going to be moving it up and down. And I, and I could also, you know, pull the mass and, and release it in some fashion to start the thing off. And it's going to oscillate. So it's a mechanical oscillator. So that's the physical setting of the problem. Okay, so we're going to solve this and we're going to use the methods that we have talked about in order to do it. It helps a little bit in order to rewrite this equation so that it looks a little bit more pleasant. It's got a lot of constants in there. It's got this function in there. At the minute, it looks a little bit daunting. 
So let's, let's massage it into something that looks a bit more pleasant. So in order to do that, I'm going to redefine a few things. So I'm going to define a new variable, y of t. That's what I'm really interested in here. I'm going to, I'm going to define it to be big X of t minus mg over k. All right. So let's first of all put that in there. Right. This is a constant. So the derivatives of this are just equal to the derivatives of that. So I have m y dot dot equals mg. Now I've got minus d y dot. And then in here, there's a minus k times x. OK, so that's minus k times y plus mg over k. That's this term plus k times big Y. Right, so that's just replacing the big X by the little y. And at this stage, you suddenly realize why I've done that, because that cancels with that. So I've successfully eliminated one term by just rewriting big X as little y. OK, so the other things that are helpful to do are to now come along and divide by the big M and then just to call some of the coefficients other things. So let's do that. That's going to make the equation look even more appealing. OK. So when we go through all of this, we are going to get something with a minimum number of parameters in there. And it's going to be a recognizable second order constant coefficient linear ODE that's inhomogeneous, at which point we know exactly how to solve it by breaking it down into the homogeneous solutions and the particular solution. So that's where we're going. OK. So to complete the rewrite, I divide by m. So there's a y dot dot term left over here. Let's take this to that side. So I get plus d over m, y dot. Then I've got a k, y. Let's take that to this side as well. So I get k over m, y. And what's left over is just going to be this term, which is k, y naught, cosine of omega t. And I've divided by m. So let's just clean it up a little bit. Let's call this coefficient here 2 gamma. So this is the drag coefficient, the mass. There's some sort of parameter that comes out now, which is a measure of the drag. Right? This coefficient here, I'll call big omega squared. Oops. Let's put that in view. And this here, I'll call A. You'll see why I've put a 2 there and a square there in a minute. OK? Um, the equation at this point is y dot dot plus 2 gamma y dot dot for the derivatives here in time plus omega squared y is equal to A cosine omega t. Right, so this is like an amplitude parameter of the inhomogeneous term, which has got a frequency omega. And then I've got this spring, this springy constant, right? The, the original spring constant is there. Now it's become embedded in here. And this is this damping constant, this drag constant. That's the equation, right? That's a somewhat simpler version of what we had. OK. So having got to here, we're now going to solve this via what's now a familiar methodology. OK, now the first step is to compute the homogeneous solutions. So let's do that. So I've told you that we've got this mechanical oscillator system. It's got the potential to oscillate, right? I mean, it's a spring. It's got a mass and a spring, so it could well oscillate. But we have included damping. And you might wonder what happens if the damping becomes too strong. 
if the damping becomes too strong, it's going to be very hard for the, the mass to do anything. That would be more like having the mass immersed in treacle than air, because the drag in air is usually quite small, but the drag in treacle would be huge. So, uh, homogeneous problem. Here it is. I ditch the right-hand side because I'm doing the homogeneous problem and I look at the auxiliary equation. I can solve this. I can, in fact, I can complete the square for the first two terms. That's completing the square, and I have an omega squared is equal to zero, so I immediately see that m plus gamma all squared is equal to gamma squared minus omega squared. Let me just remind you once again that somehow the springy bit is in the omega, and gamma relates to the damping, the drag. So clearly, weighing this off against that is going to be some measure of how strong the damping is in comparison to the springiness. And clearly, the solutions of the auxiliary equation here, they're going to depend upon whether this is positive or negative. Right, so there's going to be a situation where gamma squared is bigger than omega squared. If that's the case, then this thing is positive. I then take a square root and I find that m is going to be minus gamma plus or minus the square root of gamma squared minus omega squared. Right. So, two real solutions. So I get an A1, E to the, let's call these M1 and M2. For definiteness, we can take M1 to have the plus sign. There's the homogeneous solutions in this case, right? I have a gamma squared minus omega squared here, so that number there is less than gamma squared, which means that the square root is less than gamma, so both of these solutions are negative. Okay, that means that I have two decaying exponentials. So everything just decays away without oscillating. All right, so that's the situation where the mass is in treacle. Right? It's in such a dissipative medium that even though it's got a spring attached to it, it can't oscillate. So there's no oscillations. It's too damped. So the traditional way of describing this is to say that it's overdamped. It's an oscillator because it's got a spring on there. However, the damping is too much. It wipes out the oscillations, so it's overdamped. Right, that's one of the possibilities here. Okay. That's going to happen if, you, as I say, you have some relatively viscous medium that's giving you a hell of a lot of drag. If you are in air, that's not what you're going to get you're going to be in a different situation. So the damping is not going to be that strong. And if the damping is not that strong, you expect this to be smaller than that. So the right-hand side here is negative. If that's the case, if gamma squared is less than omega squared, then I have that m is equal to minus gamma plus or minus. Now, that's negative, so I get an imaginary number when I take the square root, and I'll just write that like so. So there it is. M is minus gamma plus or minus I times that. Okay, note that if gamma is zero, then M is equal to plus or minus I omega. Okay. 
right? So if there's no damping at all, then the, the big omega here is going to be was going to give you the value of m with an i in there. That means that the solutions would be cosine omega t and sine omega t, the big omega, right? So actually the big omega would be the natural frequency of the spring system if there was no damping. That's why we've used big omega squared as the coefficient here. All right. Anyway, so this is a case where the damping is not strong enough to stop the system oscillating. What's the answer? Well, we still have this minus gamma in there. So the solution for y, instead of being something like that, we would have an e to the minus gamma t times something like c cosine of that square root plus d times sine of that square root Now I should emphasize that everything is inside the cosine there and everything is inside the sine there. Okay, so that's the solution in this particular case. So now it can now oscillate. There's the sines and cosines that would oscillate. It does still have this exponential factor out front which is decaying. So these would be decaying oscillations. that called, right, the previous case was overdamped. Since it can now oscillate, it's not damped enough to stop the oscillations, so this is called underdamped. The opposite to this. Okay, now there is one other case, which is when the right-hand side is neither positive or negative, but zero here, right? That's somehow in between under and over damped. So the third case is where gamma squared equals omega squared, and that would then tell us that m was equal to minus gamma. That's one solution. So if I think about what I've just done, I've solved the homogeneous problem when I had gamma squared being bigger than omega squared, that was the previous case, the overdamped case. That was where I had two real and unequal solutions of the auxiliary equation. This case, the underdamped case, that's where I have complex solutions. This is where the solutions are real and equal. So the recipe for building the homogeneous solutions in that situation is to generate a new solution by adding a factor of the independent variable. So I need to say that y is some constant, a times e to the minus gamma t, that's one of the solutions, and then the other solution, let's call it b, I add a factor of t. So there it is, that's the, new, the other solution that you would get in the situation where you have real equal solutions of the auxiliary equation. And this is called critically damped. Right, that's just on the edge. Right, it's, it's the threshold between the two other cases. You'll notice that it's still going to decay exponentially. It doesn't oscillate. The only kind of difference is that there's this t there, which means that this term doesn't decay as quickly as that one. Right? So it's slightly weaker than just pure exponential decay. It's got that extra t in there. Aside from that, there's, that's the only sort of characteristic of that particular case. All right, so those are homogeneous solutions. We've got these three settings depending upon how big the drag is. Okay. So. That's the first part of the problem. 
these solutions, these homogeneous solutions, right, they are what you would get if you had nothing on the right-hand side, right? There'd be no inhomogeneous term. That's what the homogeneous solutions are. So strictly speaking, I guess I should have put an H there, right? These are the homogeneous solutions. Okay. So the homogeneous solutions... We either find pure exponential decay or decaying oscillations. That means that eventually they'll go away. In an initial value, probably, you might, you might be interested in them. But if you wait long enough, because they go away, they're not going to be very interesting anymore. And that's the perspective I'm going to take next. And it allows me to focus on only the particular solution, which, as we will see, takes a different form. OK. So these homogeneous solutions, they do eventually go away whenever there's any damping. These are the natural... oscillations or response of the system. Right? If you were to kick it to begin with, if you just kick the mass, you generate these particular decaying oscillations or exponentially decaying disturbances. And it depends whether you're in air or treacle. So what about moving the stage up and down, moving my hand up and down? That gives you a particular solution, because moving the stage up and down, that was the thing that led to the right-hand side of the equation. Right, that's the forcing. All right, so let's just remember what the equation was. It's y prime primed plus 2 gamma y primed plus omega squared y is equal to a cosine of omega t. Right, so this is the, the strength of the forcing. That was related to what I called y0. And the cosine omega t, that was the sinusoidal motion of the stage, or my hand. OK, so the particular solution. How do we get that? Well, the recipe is to look at the function on the right-hand side. And then based upon what it is, you come up with a trial particular solution. If it's a cosine, then the thing to do is to try a cosine and a sine. By now, we've done this a couple of times, and it should be clear that whenever there's a first derivative term, you need both. OK. So let's just do some derivatives. The second derivative is dead easy. It's just minus omega squared times the original thing. And that's the first derivative. So I need to feed these into the equation and, and choose the c and the d so that I can get the coefficient on the right-hand side correct. All right, so let's do that. Gives us a little bit of algebra to do. Now, I should warn you that we are now going to indulge in that algebra. And we're going to get a little bit lost in it. Fear not. It's probably more algebra than you will be given in test conditions, unless I've had a bad day. So let's just go through. I'm, I'm trying to calculate these coefficients, and that's where the algebra will come in. So I have this plus 2 gamma that plus omega squared that. So let's just write it all out. It's minus omega squared times c times the cosine. So I'm just going to gather all of the cosine terms together. And then all of the sine terms together. <coughs> 
So in here, I get minus omega squared times C. Now from the two gamma, I get a y prime, so I'm picking out the cosine, so it's omega d. And then there's a plus omega squared times c there. That's the big omega squared. Similarly, in the sine, there's a minus omega squared d, and there's going to be a big omega squared d there. And then the only one that I have to think about is that I have a 2 gamma with a minus omega c. So I have that. So that's what I feed my trial particular solution into the left-hand side. That's got an equal cosine of omega t. And now I'm off to the races to just calculate c and d. So let's get rid of this in my equation anymore. Oh, look at this, multitasking. As you've probably noticed, cleaning the board is the trickiest thing of using the light board. I wonder whether Obi-Wan Kenobi had a similar problem with his lightsaber, accidentally chopping his toes off or something. OK, so let's just solve it. We need, let's do this one first. There's no sign on that side. So I have to have that 2 gamma omega c should equal omega squared minus little omega squared d. All right, that's setting that thing to 0. And looking at the other one, it's omega squared minus little omega squared c plus 2 gamma omega d equals to A. Right? Remember, A is known, omega is known. The big omega, the gamma here, it's all known. The only things you don't know are the C and the D. Here I can then divide by this to get D equals to 2 gamma omega C divided by omega squared minus little omega squared. And I can feed that into there. So I get omega squared minus little omega squared times C, but now this is going to have a C in 2. And then there's a 2 omega gamma, and there's another 2 omega gamma. And then I've got that thing in the de denominator, equals A. OK, so C I can write as A times omega squared minus little omega squared, all divided by omega squared minus little omega squared plus 4 gamma squared omega squared. Yep, that's multiplying by a factor of omega squared minus little omega squared. And then dividing by what's in front of C. So that's what C is. D is that C times this. And that's sort of convenient because instead of getting a factor of omega squared minus little omega squared, I guess just get that one. Let's put this inside a square bracket. So there's the square brackets again, and it's this thing. Great. Now then, I don't need any of the top stuff anymore. I've actually now arrived at my solution because I can just simply feed the values of C and D into what I posed as my particular solution now. And I have a cosine of omega t and a sine of omega t. And that was the whole point. Right, so with that, with that C, I can write the particular solution as C cosine of omega t plus D sine omega t. Now you'll notice, of course, that this solution is a pure cosine and a pure sine. There's no exponential decay. So these are oscillations. These are non-decaying oscillations. Right, so what have we got? We've got a forced response here. This thing has got the A in there. That's the forcing term, right? 
that's the forcing amplitude, right? It's, it's this bit of the solution that comes purely from the forcing, right? It's a non-decaying oscillation. It's the forced response. the inhomogeneous term, A cosine omega Now, at some point it's kind of helpful to sort of draw a solution like that. And it's a bit awkward if you've got both a sine and a cosine. However, it is possible to write this as some constant times a cosine of omega t minus some other constant. That's like an amplitude and a phase. Drawing this is a lot easier than drawing that. So there's some algebra involved with getting from one to the other. So let's just quickly talk about that. How can I make this equal to that? Well, in order to do that, the first thing you should do is to use a trig formula to make this look like a sine omega t and a cosine omega t. So it's cosine a plus b. That's the formula. That's the trig formula that you use. Cosine of that minus that turns out to be cosine of omega t, cosine of delta, plus sine omega t, sine delta. Right, that's the trig formula, handy trig formula that you can look up. And these are the c's and d's, right? So this is a different way of writing that. I know what the c and the d are there. Having expanded this cosine into this, I can immediately read off that S cosine of delta has to be the same thing as C, and S sine delta, that has to be the same thing as D. Right? If this is going to equal that, I, that has to be true. Now, given that I know C and D, this is not a very helpful formula because what I would like to do is figure out what the big S and the delta are. So this is backwards, but I can immediately manipulate this to get a formula for big S and delta. Actually, if I take this equation and divide by that one, the big S cancels off, and I immediately arrive at tan delta is equal to D over C. Well, that just says that delta is equal to tan to the minus one of D over C. That's D and that's C. If I take that and divide by that, the denominators cancel off, the A's cancel off, and what I get left with is 2 gamma omega divided by omega squared minus little omega squared. Okay, so that's how you get delta. Now, to express big S in terms of C and D, what I can do is I can square them and add them. S squared times sine squared plus s squared times cosine squared. That's obviously c squared plus d squared. And you'll remember that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So this one just tells me that s squared is equal to c squared plus d squared. OK. So what's s? This is a little bit more algebra. There's the C and the D. I square them and add them. So I get A squared omega squared minus little omega squared all squared divided by that thing. Let's just write it as a square bracket. All squared. All right, so that's C squared. Then I've got d squared, well that's just 4 gamma squared omega squared a squared divided by the same denominator. All right, so that square bracket is just what's inside here, but it's squared. Now, I'm adding them two, two things together. There's a common factor of a squared. Let's put that outside. 
And then you'll realize that what's left over, there's a common denominator and omega squared minus little omega squared plus four gamma squared omega squared. That's exactly what's inside the square bracket. So this whole thing is nothing more than a squared divided by one factor of the square bracket. And this is s squared. So the last thing to do is just to take a square root. And I'm done. That's s. Now you'll notice that when I took the square root, I didn't put plus or minus there. Traditionally, when you write down something like this, and you have an amplitude and a phase, the amplitude is just positive. That's the tradition. So I'm going to pick a positive amplitude here. So I'm going to pick positive amplitude. And then I've got my phase here. OK, so that's the answer. That's what s and delta have to be. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the live lectures. In the remaining few minutes of this segment, I did want to say something a little bit more about this. Perhaps this idea of dropping the sign there has left you feeling a little uncomfortable. Because right? when you take a square root, there should be a plus or a minus. And somehow I'm hoping that any choice of sign must have somehow got wrapped up into delta. I'll explain that in a moment. So this is just going to be a quick diversion talking about sines and cosines and tangent functions. So. The main thing is, given the C and the D there, how do you choose the S and the delta? And I'm going to do it in such a way that that's always positive. All right? This is the idea right, that I'm going to elaborate more on now. So to do that, we don't need all of this complication of what C and D were. We just have the formulae that I've written down that delta is 10 to the minus 1 of d over c, and s is equal to the square root of c squared plus d squared. Right? These choices achieve that. Okay? So what about the sign stuff, and what might be a slight awkward detail of all of this? Now, in order to think about that, let's just consider the tangent function. What does the tangent function look like? Well, it's periodic, so I'm just going to draw it between 0 and 2 pi. Right. So I'm going to plot tan delta as a function of delta. And as you might remember, at pi by 2, and at 3 pi by 2, that's pi there, something unpleasant happens to the tangent function. If I was to try and draw it, I would get something like this. Right, it's got this asymptote of, where it heads off to infinity, plus or minus infinity, at pi by 2 and 3 pi by 2. It looks like that. That's the tangent function. Okay. Now then, what I need is the tan of delta to equal something. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that that something is this. Right? So let's assume that that is d over c. Right? So what this operation here is equivalent to is figuring out the deltas that achieve tan delta equal to that. Well, here's the tangent function where it hits that green line, that is where you get the solution of that equation. You know, and it's a periodic thing between 0 and 2 pi. The awkward thing is, of course, that there are two possible solutions here. Both of those values of delta give you 
tan delta is equal to d over c. So both of these they give tan delta is equal to d over c. Right, one of them is here, one of them's you know between 0 and pi by 2, the other one's between pi by 2 and 3 by pi by 2, the way where I've put it. Oh, I missed a piece of my tangent function off there. Because it continues here, right? Comes up, goes through, and then heads off to infinity again when I get beyond 2 pi. Had d over c been negative, then I would have got two choices down there. That's a minor point. Okay. Anyway, there are these two choices. Which one do you choose? So I've got two possibilities here. Let's call them delta 1 and delta 2. So given a c and d, I calculate that, and I calculate two possible deltas. Right, there's only one S. Right, I take the, the inverse tangent function and there are two possibilities. And you can clearly see that they're going to be the same, but they differ by that amount, which is pi. Right, this thing's repeating itself after pi, so they differ by pi. Right, delta 2, for example, I can think about it as delta 1 plus pi. Now, how do I figure out which of these is the proper one to choose? So we've got the tangent function. Now let's just switch that around and think about what sines and cosines do. Now remember that ultimately, I want S cosine delta to equal C and S sine delta to equal D. All right, that's really what I need at the end of the day. So let's have a look. That's pi 2 pi. This is going to be delta. And let's look at sine. Well, sine does something like this. And cosine of delta over the same interval, there's pi, there's 2 pi, that does modulo my terrible artistry. That does this. Right, cosine is 1 at 0 minus 1 at pi. Sine is 0 at 0 pi 2 pi, pi by 2 it's 1, so on. Okay, so the way that I drew the previous example, right, I had this tangent function, right, it, it did this, then it did this, and I said let's choose this for c over d, and I have that one and that one, that's pi by 2, right, and that's 3 pi by 2, right, they were, they were on either side of pi by 2. Okay, and here's pi by 2. So, I've got one solution that would be this value and one solution that would be on the other side of pi by 2, right? So there's this one, and I didn't draw it very well. It should have been way, tilted over way further that way. Let me just do it again very quickly, just so I don't confuse you. Right, so here's the one doing that, there's the one like that. So I said, let's take that as an example. There's one solution, there's the other solution. They differ by pi. Right, so one's between 0 and 2 pi, the other one's between pi and 3 pi by 2. Right, so one is, for example, there, and then the other one's sort of here. One's there, and the other one's there. Those are the two solutions. So you'll notice immediately that if I take that solution, the sign has got to be positive. And the cosine here has got to be positive. Whereas if I was to pick this one, the sine and cosines 
would have the, dif the different sign. Right? So the different values of delta here, the different choices of delta are going to give you different signs for the sine and cosine in there, and you have to pick the right one to get the correct signs for C and D. So the choice for the delta 1 and the delta 2 is dictated by making sure you get the right sign there and there. That's the only thing you've got to watch out for because of this issue about the tangent function has two possibilities when you invert it. You have to pick the one that gives you the right signs there and there. That's the last thing to bear in mind. Okay, so that's the end of the segment and we'll get back to regular lectures in a short while.